Well, Julie, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me about this crazy pro pro problem. Uh, the thing that's uh, amazing here is that we've been talking about shortages for decades now, and they don't seem to go away. And this one seems worse than the others. Do you think so, or am I wrong? You're 100 percent right, Paul. Uh, you know, ASCO has been giving testimony in Congress dating back to 2011, 2012, when we had that cytarabine shortage for leukemias, um, as well as some other drugs. And, and, um, and so we've had roundtables, we've had summits on this, and um, very little has happened. But what makes this, this this platen, carboplatin shortage, uh, in particularly a big problem is just how many cancer types rely on these drugs as a critical part of curative uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're a breast cancer doc. So uh, can you imagine having a conversation with a patient in a curative setting or even not in a curative setting, but let's say curative at first, uh, who it would, and you would be saying, well, we can't give you the life-saving therapy. How would you even do that? And, you know, there are big ethical issues. And, you know, we're hearing from our ASCO members that they need help in how to talk to patients. And, you know, they're having their own, you know, mental health issues related to having to have conversations like this. I, I do think um, supplying our members and their patients with, you know, alternative regimens, ways to preserve uh, the limited amount of drug they have, um, potential for doing things like instead of giving preoperative chemotherapy, uh, you know, switch to postoperative chemo so that we can give a few more weeks uh, to months to, to get more supply, you know, having that ammunition of here are things we're doing and we really are going to do everything we can to get you the critical drugs you need. If there's a substitute regimen that's really equally effective, then you know, let's let our members know, let's let their patients know so we can preserve these drugs for those situations where there really is truly no alternative. Well, but I, I guess I, I, I'm not a doctor, but uh, I thought that the number of uh, alternatives that it would be equivalent is, is very low. If you're talking about, you know, carboplatin, you might switch a large set of patients to cisplatin. Uh, and then what? You know, what? there is no then what? Yeah, I think uh, we've got a group we pulled together from our guidelines group who've worked with the Society for Gynecologic Oncology on coming up with some potential alternative regimens um, and drugs. Uh, so we hope to, within the next week or two, hoping by the time of the ASCO annual meeting, to have that on the website. We just don't have it quite together yet. So you're right. Usually, if you can't get one platinum agent, a logical substitution is the other one. But there are cases where there are non platinum regimens that might not be as commonly used, but there are trials that, that show that they probably have similar efficacy. It's just for a variety of reasons, they have not been the number one preferred uh, regimen. So no, it, this is, don't get me wrong, this is a disaster. We need to do everything we can to short term, get the supply back up, get these drugs to patients, and, and then more importantly, now we've got to use the political will that I think is coming from these horrible, horrible situations and work with our legislators, work with the regulatory agencies and help work at, on the market and the manufacturing end so that we have permanent solutions in place. I can't even imagine the talking points in this case. Uh, I know they exist already, but good. God, how would you even write that? The, the talking points to the patients? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, that it's it's tough, Paul, but, you know, we're 
we're oncologists, we're always weighing risks and benefits and, you know, toxicities versus efficacy. And every single conversation is going to be very patient specific as it should be. Um, I think knowing that physicians, that hospitals, that cancer centers, the FDA, everybody is working hard to try to fix the situation. So we're hoping that by June, uh, you know, we will be in a much, much better place. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I, I don't mean to put ASCO on the spot because you didn't create this problem. You're, you're just trying to, 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 to deal with it. But how did this happen? You've looked at it. Well, you know, so the big picture of drug shortages, whether cancer drugs or others, it's mostly about manufacturing quality problems. And it's been primarily kind of the generic sterile injectables. So quality issues of number one, this particular quality issue is about a surprise audit where documents were found that were shredded and the plant got shut down. That plant that made raw materials supplied all of the manufacturers, at least in the US kind of FDA approved manufacturers of cisplatin and carboplatin. So, you know, there was no redundancy. The FDA does not have the authority, which we need to fix, to know for a given manufacturer, where are they getting their raw materials, mm -hmm. right? So we had, we had redundancy across manufacturers of these drugs, which in theory should look good. You know, my understanding is we had five manufacturers, but they all sourced from the same one place in India that got shut down for quality reasons. And the FDA did not have the authority to demand that each manufacturer say where they're getting their raw materials. So that's got to be fixed. I think we will fix that, that the FDA will have the right to demand that. We also, I think we need to have some more transparency, Paul, on when a place gets shut down, when there's a quality issue that's found and a report is issued, we, you and I, ASCO, you know, our members, we don't have visibility of that report. You know, it just says, you know, the plant was shut down quality. It doesn't say what the issues were. I think we need more transparency about when quality issues are found, what are they? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. yeah. If I look at the uh, uh, shortages website, the database rather at, at FDA, uh, I, I'm, I'm not seeing what you've just said. No details. No details can you find there. And we de we deserve to have more details. And there needs to be more transparency. So legislative fix might take some time. How soon do you think this can be can go away? Because this is this is people are dying. So we we've seen just in the last week, and we're posting every time more cisplat or carboplat gets released in the US, we are posting, we are saying what company it's coming from. And there was just another uh, release of Carbo yesterday, which we posted on our website, we're putting it on Twitter. So um, so it, we are seeing more release, we are seeing more drug coming out, we are hoping that sometime in June, that this will not be so critical. I think we'll still need to be careful uh, in June and try to maximize the supply we have. But I, we're hoping as we're watching this day by day, week by week, slow release of more and more drug that we've hit the bottom and we're slowly starting to come out again. Um, so you think it's going to be months longer or you just don't know, probably it's not, not yeah. Hard, hard. Hard to know. Uh, we're going to have to be careful with these drugs for a while, I think. But being able to get them to the critical patients who need them, uh, I think, hopefully will be markedly better within a month. That's my guess. I don't know. You don't know. I certainly don't. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. What else can? Uh, well, what about clinical trials? Uh, there, there is going to be an impact on clinical trials. Absolutely. Uh, when platinum is in either the control or the experimental arm, and you can't access it, uh, it uh, either pauses your study or you know you have to scramble and come up with an alternative. So there will be trials uh, that are impacted by this hopefully only for a month or two, it, you know, but we've learned how to be a bit more flexible. I mean, just, you know, just think about this leading up to this acute issue, we had the pandemic mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, back in 2020, you know, as the pandemic hit, um, there was a survey of US oncology pharmacists on oncology drug shortages that led to delays in chemo changes in treatment or omission, uh, complications of clinical research, et cetera. And there were like five or six cancer related drugs that just the pandemic and the issue of the pandemic, you know, globally in the US impacting manufacturing um, did that. So we were vulnerable from the pandemic and you know, fludarabine has been a big recent issue as well. It impacts far less patients um, than cisplatin and carboplat, but it's equally critical in the smaller number of patients where it's critical. Currently, we have 15 oncology drug shortages listed on the FDA's website. The only critical, critical ones right this minute are the platinum agents, but you know, there are others at risk, others in shorter supply. Um, so we've got to fix this. And I think based on this drug shortage disaster, uh, we have some political will to really push this through. We've been asked to provide testimony, you know, to the House, uh, to the Senate. This is a uh, being viewed as a national security issue. So we've got bipartisan support to push this through, um, I think. Is this an NCI issue? Perhaps NCI could, somebody suggested that NCI should just administer a stockpile of cisplatin and carboplatin and maybe other drugs as well. Um, so I'm not, so we've talked about, should we have a government stockpile? What I, I hadn't, heard NCI as a house for it. You know, we, <clears throat> we've talked about doing it <clears throat> through the mechanism of, you know, the VA and, you know, Medicare and, you know, all of that. Um, they have big buying power, right? So um, they're buying the drugs. The NCI is not really buying the drugs. So it might make more sense if we do want to create stockpiles of some critical, critical drugs uh, that it be done through some uh, government mechanism that's already buying um, the drugs. And, and another point that um, that when we have such buying power from our government, you know, VA, Medicare, Medicaid, um, we shouldn't be getting all of that from one source either. We should try to help the market uh, and provide incentives so that we would encourage, if not mandate, that our government purchase of these drugs be across maybe three different manufacturers for any given drug. That helps with stability, long-term contracts, keeps the manufacturers in the market so that they don't drop out. Mm -hmm. So I guess I guess there has to be a way of, of fixing the economics of the problem if you can't fix it in a regulatory fashion. I, I think we're going to have to agree that, you know, for these drugs that are just dirt cheap, you know, I saw one briefing, they compared the price of these drugs to that of a McDonald's hamburger. You know, when these drugs, especially the high volume ones, go generic, there's a race to get in to make the generics, and it's a race to the bottom in terms of price. And so you lose a lot of, of especially some of the higher quality manufacturers. And we've got to have incentives to keep high quality manufacturers um, in the market. And it's going to have to be through some of these long-term contracts, through distributing the, the contracts and the purchasing across multiple manufacturers and agreeing 
maybe to pay a little bit more. And, you know, the FDA created this quality management maturity index, which was supposed to help um, assess the quality of a manufacturer. And that might help influence where you buy your drug, drug from. But it's at this point, it's 100% voluntary. Um, so there's no mandate that you need to be part of this index and that it's visible. So uh, one of our talking points is it would be important, I think, to have some kind of quality reporting index, such as the FDA's quality management maturity index, be mandatory and be visible and be used in purchasing and, and maybe rewarding hospitals and cancer centers that purchase X percent of their drugs through the high quality sites to try to encourage that. Does ASCO have a model legislation or some kind of a draft of something that, that you're proposing? I'd love to see that or publish it. So um, on our website, we have the, um, the testimony that we've given um, to the House Appropriations Committee on Agriculture, Rural Development, and uh, FDA. Um, we've also got statements and responses that we've given just in the last month, really, um, to various committees in the House and the Senate. Um, so specifically, what we're, what we're telling our, we don't have the legislation draft per se, but what we're telling our members in contacting lawmakers is one, um, there are four major House sponsors of a Dear Colleague letter that is going around. We're encouraging our members to write to their representatives to sign on to this Dear Colleague letter that's asking for additional flexibilities and authorities um, that are needed to prevent or mitigate future shortages. You can read that letter. You can go to our our asco.org slash drug hyphen shortages website and see the, that letter. And then for the Senate, they don't have such a letter circulating, but we're encouraging, you know, write, write to your senators to one, improve FDA's visibility into the supply chain that gets to where their raw materials come from. Two, you know, it, look into it importation if existing manufacturers can't ramp up importation of manufacturers not currently approved by the FDA a uh, better communication in advance to health systems so we can help plan for shortages um examining we're asking our senators to examine economic incentives that are currently driving generic manufacturers out of the market so we're we're kind of saying we should encourage long term contracts guaranteed prices and then lastly, we're saying write to your senator and have them talk about how do we incentivize U.S.-based production of critical medications? How do we do price stabilization? And how do we invest in the more advanced and high quality manufacturing in our country? So, you know, we, that's not legislation per se, but it's things we want various Senate committees and subcommittees and House committees to be working on. Is there room for an executive order? Is it enough of a problem right now? Um, not not sure about that. We have not called for that yet. Um, if we can't, you know, we're a little distracted uh, at the present time <laughs> with our our debt ceiling. But um, but it, you know, it might come to it if we can't get anything through our. Uh, our current Congress. See, this should have been my first question, but uh, but but I, I guess it's really there's so much to this. But but have you seen the numbers for the, of for, of patients who who are affected by this? Is there a number somewhere? Yeah. So um, you know, we've worked on trying to figure out a number, as have others. So. The FDA approval for these drugs is really in ovarian, testicular, and bladder cancer. And so if you take where there is actually an approved label and you look at that and you kind of 
take into account that testicular it's only the advanced or metastatic that are getting platinum agents and all it's at least a hundred thousand but then you add on top of you know where there's a label you've got cervical cancer non-small cell lung cancer head and neck cancers for example you know there are estimates that up to 500,000 patients possibly could have a stage and a diagnosis that would rely on a platinum agent. Although I think that 500,000 hasn't adjusted for you know stages where we wouldn't use it. So Paul, it's somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 of Americans each year would be diagnosed uh, or have a cancer that this would be relevant to. Ooh. It's a lot of patients. Astounding. That's as a percentage of the total, that would be what uh uh what would be the overall number of people with cancer. Yeah. So what's our... patients a year? Uh I can do you have that? So uh I think we have about 1.8 million new cases reported annually, somewhere around there. So it's close to a third, a little under a third at the yeah. and, and this is why this particular shortage has risen, you know, to, you know, headlines in all the papers and stressed on the part of patients, physicians, healthcare systems everywhere. It's just the absolute number of patients impacted. Wow, this really should have been my first question. <laughs> but is there anything I forgot to ask? Anything we forgot to talk about? Yeah. Um, well, we we once the acute shortage is over, we cannot forget about this. So we've got to keep pushing, pushing. We've got to all be partners in helping with an early alert system. Um, so in addition to writing to members of Congress. We're asking our members, we on our ASCO drug shortage website, we are um, we show where you can report to the FDA. Um, any drug shortage your particular you know clinic is is having trouble getting certain certain drugs. We need that really, really early alert system so that we can anticipate problems and be a little more proactive as opposed to reactive, which is a lot of what happened this time. Thank you very much.